I'm really pleased to have Jimmy Adams here today. Uh, Jimmy's going to kick off our day today, and Jimmy is, um, you know, an old friend, um, an old student, though it's hard to call him that these days because he's like surpassed me in so many ways. Um, he's written probably the best book on network data collection that's currently available, and he's collected data from every modality you can imagine, um, you know, from extent data on TV shows to commercial <laughs> sex workers in Africa, so it's like an everything in between, and uh, I really am pleased that he can be here today, so um, Jimmy, the show's yours. Take Great. Away. Thanks. Glad to be here. Um, I, I struggled with trying to figure out what we meant when we were thinking about advanced topics on data collection. So this is going to be a smorgasbord of kind of thinking through some of the where we've been, where we are, and where I think we are heading um, in terms of network data collection, or some opportunities is the way I'm thinking about the way we're, way we're heading in ways that's similar to some of the ways Jim structured things yesterday. Um, so I'm going to focus primarily on thinking about modalities of network data collection, um, and we'll talk through a few examples of of, of these in particular, and I'll use them to leverage a few points. Um, and then I'll get to, into a few details of kind of some practical considerations that take place as we, as we collect and, and uh, evaluate network data, da network data. And then I'll talk very briefly about some ethical considerations. I know there are other sessions on this through the week, um, but I can't not talk about this anytime I'm given the opportunity to talk about networks. Um, so, I will say this is going to kind of not be a kind of overview of approaches. If you, if you are looking for those in the kind of network data collection space, I recommend kind of chapter length treatments in Gary Robbins' book or um, uh, uh, Peter Marsden's chapter in John Scott's book, um, in Scott and Carrington's old book. Um, there's actually a revised version of that coming out this year. Um, that if you want something a little more in depth, there is a green, sage little green book. I have mixed feelings about that one. Um, I wrote it. Um, um, uh, as soon as the book comes out, there's things you want to change for what it's worth. Um, so, but anyway, so we won't really talk about network sampling and measurement issues. We probably aren't going to talk about kind of standard evaluation of network data um, that I've spent a, a fair amount of time thinking about. Those are there. I'm going to think about some other something that we often give less attention to, and that is kind of the practicalities of how we do this, rather than kind of the principles of, of, of the approaches. So. That's where we're going to start, and I'm going to organize this um, kind of along the way that a uh, chapter that Miranda Lubbers and I have in that updated version of the, of the Sage book, um, where we think about modalities of network data collection, how, it's, how they've been deployed and kind of the principles behind them, particularly as illustrated in four kind of primary uh, uh, approaches, experiments, observational research, um, surveys and interviews we lump together for a variety of reasons I'll talk about later, and digital trace data. I think in my kind of Sage book, um, I talked about these as thinking about kind of data collection strategies where the participants are kind of actively involved in the process versus ones where they're kind of passively involved in the process. I think that dimension makes some sense. I'm still trying to figure out what's going on on the, on the other side. I have a label, but I don't think it works. Um, so I'm just going to skip right past it. Um, so anyway, um, so like I said, I'm going to talk through each one of these in turn, give some examples so that hopefully illustrates what I think they're good at, what they, I think they have some, some limitations on, and how we've kind of adapted those, and also some potential opportunities going forward for each one of these. So in the experimental domain, you know, we can really think about the idea here as being focused on control and often causal inference aims, right? Um, and this is... And one of the claims I'm going to make here is we often, a lot of people seem to think of networks as something that has kind of blossomed in the last, depending on who they are, 20 years, 15 years, whatever. I'm going to point out that almost all of these have a history that goes back many, many, many decades. Um, and so one example of kind of these experimental um, approaches were, were early kind of social psychological, particularly within organizational um, network studies, were thinking about how network structure can be manipulated in ways to produce optimal outcomes, in this case of communication patterns and communication flows, and thinking about how different types of tasks require different types of network structure um, to optimize those processes. Um, but this is, this is nice because it allows us to think in those kind of structural intuitions of what different structural patterns generate what different types of processes or outcomes we might be interested in. Um, and that's something that, you know, if we're interested in kind of making causal inferences, these experimental conditions provide the opportunities to, to do this in, in nice ways sometimes. Um, and this is kind of parallel to some things Jim, Jim said yesterday. We can think about the um, 
the kind of foci or the kind of outcomes that are being, being uh, assessed in experimental conditions is often driven by either thinking of a network as existing and things flowing over them. So we are manipulating the, the things on top of a network or we might be manipulating the network structure itself. Um, and in experimental settings, I'd say the kind of network dynamic or dynamics of networks, network chain stuff, I, I, the social exchange literature has done a lot of this going back to, this is a classic paper from Karen Cook and, and Emerson. Um, where they show kind of different network structural properties lead to different exchange patterns within uh, an experimental uh, population of exchange relationships. Alternatively, we have a kind of recent um, in, uh, proliferation of particular kind of experimental designs online, especially where you take a network structure as fixed, you seed it with some information, some behavior, some idea, and see how that flows over the population. And we can think about um, those experimental opportunities as ways to think about how structure is, is associated with the various di diffusion outcomes or other types of flow patterns, which you'll hear more about tomorrow. Um, but the thing I would say that this has really been driven by is m not as much about kind of patterns, but how those patterns generate processes and or mechanisms that we're potentially interested in in the social sciences and social and behavioral and health sciences. Um, so for example, this is going all back straight back to you know when I was taking classes with Jim in grad school, right? The the Coleman boat, if you've ever been from you've ever heard of this idea that we often observe patterns at this kind of top level, kind of macro level patterns, excuse me. I thought somebody had a question. Um, so uh, of kind of macro level associations that we're, we can often kind of account for in a population. And these infer kind of micro level processes that might happen. But Coleman's claim was, oops, excuse me. Coleman's claim was that we have a hard time kind of aggregating those micro level processes up into accounting for those macro level patterns. And the idea is networks, particularly network experiments, might be a, have proven to be a particularly germane opportunity to do this in ways that Coleman said was a problem. And I think we've, we've demonstrated that experiments kind of allow us to do this a little bit more. Um, and other types of processes that in the health sciences we're particularly kind of familiar with, you know, moderation and mediation sorts of processes can also be accounted for in these experimental conditions in useful ways that are not really available to us in more observational types of research, for whatever that's worth. So, um, not surprisingly, um, one of the kind of often caveats to experimental designs is how much this kind of generalizes outside of the context in which the experiments were conducted, um, whether or not these are kind of artificial environments that have um, kind of real world implications is sometimes clear, sometimes less clear. Um, and so there's been a lot of frameworks to think about kind of how this translation of what's going on inside an experimental condition relates to what's going on outside. And this is um, from a chapter by uh, Matt Brashears in the Oxford Handbook that came out a couple years ago. Um, and one of his colleagues, and where they kind of talk about the kind of spectrum of experimental um, approaches that are available generally and within networks in particular. And I would argue that one thing that is unique to, and this is one of the things I like to focus on, is what's unique about network research versus kind of what's general between kind of networks and all kind of science uh, approaches, is that I would argue that a lot of our experiments um, have different uh, causal implications than ones that are less kind of relationally oriented in that sometimes the, the kind of generalization as Jim was answering a question yesterday is more about process and mechanism and those are the things we're trying to generalize instead of from sample to population. And um, if you're interested in more on that idea, Russ Bernard has, has some really kind of cool uh, language about arguing that. To whoever was asking that question about generalization yesterday, I think we, um, particularly in sociology, have this terrible habit of thinking of generalization as only kind of a st statistical inference from sample to population and there's lots of other forms of it. I teach a lot about kind of theoretical generalization which I think this is something that we in the kind of network experimental or they in the network experimental kind of world um, are, are really attuned to. I say they because I don't really do experiments. Um, the one kind of big caveat that I've noticed in this literature in particular is a strong divergence from observational research and experimental conditions. So the classic example of this is the old kind of social support literature that shows kind of various forms of social support have benefits for myriad health outcomes. And then when you try and manipulate that in experimental uh, opportunities, often we can't generate the same benefits. Um, and this is something that, you know, Lisa Berkman's work has shown in a, in a number of ways. And the question is, is that that it's a different process or is it that we're generating time that are different from the ones that provide the benefits. And I think that that is probably where some of that disconnect lies. And this is a different kind of form of generalization. Um, I would also argue that we've probably, 
Um, and ironically, and networks in particular, um, taken on the, um, the kind of orientation of experimental logics that suggests kind of variable isolation is our goal to get the causal effect of that one manipulated thing in ways that has led us to detract from the kind of notions of interdependencies that are at the core of networks um, in ways that uh, like I, I think experiments in particular could put these pieces back together a little bit more than we have. We tried to isolate in ways that take away the network value of network research, I think, in some experimental um, approaches. Is, and this is my claim, not um, a lot of others, but for what it's worth, I think that's one of the additional kind of limitations of this world. So this has led to some adaptations um, in recent um, and some not so recent kind of uh, arenas, right? So the adoption of particular kind of natural experiments um, or kind of field experiments um, compared to those that take place in a lab um, and also a move to online um, experiments that sometimes have really, really strong social, social process value. Um, and so we talk uh, in that chapter for what it's worth about these kind of comparisons quite a bit. I would also suggest there's something that experimental conditions have an opportunity to do that we haven't done a lot of to, to this point, is thinking about contextual variation, right? So doing experiments in different locales to be able to think about how those mechanisms trans, transport across places, across populations, across contexts. I mean, I've done some of this work in simulated environments that are empirically seeded um, and, and showing that if you take one, one kind of process and port that mechanism to another population, you can end up with an entirely different outcome um, as a result of initial composition, initial structure, and things like that. And I think that's something that experiments um, we're now seeing in certain, field, cer certain subfields, kind of this kind of comparative approach to experiments taking place. And I think we in the networks community could benefit from thinking similarly, um, something that we have particularly not done a lot historically because we tend to like to focus on single populations, et cetera. Um, so I'm gonna move to observation and I use this as kind of a, a broad label intentionally um, because I'm thinking about this as researcher studying a population and kind of recording their perceptions of what's going on. That could mean a lot of different things. Historically, this has been a lot of kind of ethnographic work, for example. The idea here is really to capture and account for behavior in process and in, as it's practiced um, in kind of in, in representational form in, rather than the way people talk about it, the way it kind of leaves traces of, of, of experience, et cetera, because it's focused in the language of that Brashears chapter on kind of this, these realistic and naturalistic um, kind of aims, right, which is, um, that's what it's prioritizing, I would say. So we got, you know, a classic version. This is the bank wiring room. If you're familiar with this study, the bank wiring room from the 1930s, right? Thinking about the structure of relationships in an office and how it led to performance and friendships and all kinds of other things. Um, uh, Elizabeth Bott's great work on kind of family structure um, was exactly this. You know, she was studying, um, she was embedded in studying families for a while and thinking about roles that emerge from that. So this is not, again, not a new idea, um, but it's something I'm, I, I'm increasingly suggesting that one of the biggest kind of frontiers in network research is a return to our roots in ways that we have the capacity to do things today that we didn't have capacity to do then, but we now have, but, the, but like the theory and the kind of aims are very much paralleling where the, where this, where the field started in a number of ways. So you'll, that's why I have this structured in this way a number of ways, for a number of reasons. So another thing that happens in the, these attempts to account kind of realistic and naturalistic behaviors is often a focus on dynamics, where in networks we, we have historically had a tendency to talk about structure as a kind of stable thing or the result of a process and we capture it at one point in time, but dynamics has become, um, since I was in grad school, a much more kind of important um, pattern. And I still love this example. It's, it's kind of, it's an old visualization at this point, but like it's so clear to show um, how the kind of interaction patterns within a classroom, and they have two classrooms in this paper. If you've never read this, it's fun from Dan McFarland's data where they literally had like cameras in the room and they were coding interactions of what the kids were doing throughout the course of a class period. And they, they compare these two classrooms and I'm showing you the disorganized classroom um, where, the, where the student interaction patterns, basically the teacher at some point just gives up on trying to give a lecture. And you can see that visually, and if you see the other one, you see this kind of very, in, very kind of patterned um, interaction between the students and the, and, the, and the teacher in ways that just doesn't look anything like this. And so capturing those processes is something that these observational approaches are really attuned to, whether kind of ethnographically 
co uh, coding up in this way or w whatever kind of approach. But the idea here is observe behavior as it takes place, code it up and, and analyze it that way. Um, often, as a result, this type of observational research, since it re is re just requires so much resources and kind of intensive effort on the side of the researcher, frequently has a narrower scope. Not always but frequently um, than some of our other approaches. Um, some, another thing is kind of how we systematize what we're observing. Anybody who's done field re research knows that's always a problem for any type of research. I think it's even more so for networks because what are we focusing on? The people, the relationships, time sampling. There's so many things that we can attune to that we can get lost in it. And so how we do that um, is something that I think network observational research in particular um, has struggled with historically. Um, there's one kind of fortunate ad 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 adaptation that has taken place is in various forms of digitizing these kind of uh, capture processes. Uh, I, I, when I was at Arizona State, um, they had um, these kind of lab studies in multiple places where literally they would send out like an army of grad students with these little tablets and they were observing preschoolers and they were basically coding up which preschoolers were playing with other preschoolers and what the types of interactions were and how these kind of evolved through a school year. And the way they did this was literally they would pick, they had two different sampling protocols. One was they would pick a focal student, a uh, focal kid, and they would see who that student was interacting with on like a timed interval. And you'd do this for, I think they were doing it on like 50 minute intervals. They'd do it like for 50 minutes, take a break, do it again for 50 minutes. So you can record this through a day and then through a school year. Um, and David Schaefer had, had a paper, uh, and, and that team had a paper where they showed that kind of reciprocity and transitivity processes are emerging and increasingly emerging through time in a school year of preschoolers, right? So the way they, did, they generate their networks are even following some of these patterns, and it is getting stronger across the school year, how much reciprocity and transitivity is observed. It's not just something that kind of happens. They kind of learn it, it seems like, um, at, that early, at that early stage. So these kind of observational um, strategies helped to systematize. They also create some problems of their own, I'll mention. But um, it, it is an opportunity for more kind of systematiz systematization of how we think about this kind of sampling and measurement problem of observational research in the network context. Um, what happened there? I lost my notes. Oh, there we go. Um, the other thing I would suggest um, here, in, in similar to um, uh, experimental conditions, is thinking about comparative designs um, and observational research. This is something that uh, ethnographers have, have at times debated, um, kind of the utility of like comparative ethnography in particular, but I think observational research as a whole um, often thinks in site-based research in ways that would be useful if we're thinking about generalization of mechanism, thinking about how that's observable across locale rather than just within one um, would be a useful um, extension of this. And there is emerging work doing, particularly in kind of schools in Europe, you're seeing a lot of studies trying to do exactly this. So I think that's somewhere we're going in networks. Um, just trying to be cognizant of time. Okay. Um, so I think often when we talk about network data collection, we kind of start here. We often start with surveys. I intentionally did not start with surveys today. Um, A, because it's not actually our historical roots. It's not where, where network research really started. Um, it's kind of where we evolved to at some point in time. Um, but I would also argue that it's, it itself is an adaptation. Um, and the way we kind of approach surveys was trying to optimize on things that we learned were weaknesses of either experimental or observational research in particular. And so there are things, therefore, it does particularly well. There are also things that it is not designed to do. Um, and I think sometimes we lose sight of that. And so I want to just, that's why it's positioned here. Sorry, I, I do meta commentary way too much when I give talks um, at this point. Um, but a primary aim here, not surprisingly for any of you who have worked in survey kind of context, is really thinking about systematizing measurement. And sometimes since systematizing sampling, I don't often put that here when I talk about network research in particular, because as you know, with like boundary specification and those sorts of things, our sampling notions are actually really diverse depending on the approaches you take. Um, and so it's a little less systematized than might be so for a lot of other survey research. Um, I would argue that then the kind of primary um, aims within this really differ by kind of more egocentric and complete network research, thinking about breadth of sampling and ego designs, 
This is one of my historical examples that's not quite as historical. We're only going back to the 80s, 70s and 80s at this point. But you know, the kind of ba basic kind of name generator type questions that are available in something like the General Social Survey or Claude Fisher's work, thinking about these kind of questions of who you talk to about important matters is a classic approach in ego networks. It's been criticized, but I also think there's a lot of value in questions like this, which I'll loop back to in just a second. Um, in the kind of more complete network design, we're often thinking about population saturation. And, and when I say saturation of the nodes and then the relationships, sometimes we're getting a saturation there, but often we're getting some kind of limited set, you know, five best friends or what have you, rather than kind of a full enumerations of these populations. And I think people have spent some time recently, and we're gonna talk about missing data later, um, uh, thinking about the implications of those constraints on reporting, which I've, I've, I've also spent some time writing and thinking about. Um, but for the moment, we'll think about it as the goal is kind of saturation level. Um, again, this goes back to the roots. I, I, I um, anytime I present work on the kind of those, those uh, studies of, of Moreno and Jennings, I want to try and find ones that actually cite Jennings because she was doing as much of the work. Um, and unfortunately, we attribute this to Moreno more than uh, I think is warranted. I also pull this paper for a secondary reason. I don't know if you've read this paper, but the like statistical inferences that we're doing today, they were trying to think about that. What's the random process? How does the observed differ from that random process? They were trying to build statistical models that are like the things we're doing um, in practice today. Um, so it's just, it's a fun paper um, in both of those levels because it both attributes both of them and it does these kind of fun things. Um, also, this has become kind of quite standard. I, I have to, every once in a while, just tell some weird um, kind of a side stories. When I was writing the Sage book, I, uh, um, in the back I wanted to have some resources, just there were examples of instruments, and I know you can't read what's there, um, but um, I, I emailed um, Kathy Harris, and I was like, do you all have the original kind of survey designs of ad health for the network, for the network component that I could get a copy of? And she sent me a literal like Scantron booklet, like the, the green booklets that are the ones that the students actually filled out. And I was like, man, this is uh, it's a nerdy thing that I love. I have it hanging on my wall in my office. Um, but that's what this is. <laughs> They're awesome, it just was, it was fun. Um, but anyway, um, but, the, but these kind of survey standardization processes really kind of provide the opportunity for thinking about systematized opportunities to ask questions about, in this case, who are your five best male and female friends. And the way they did it was, I don't know if you, how much you know about ad health, but in that case, they used a roster where students were literally encoding kind of numbers in bubbles on Scantron sheets, which at the time, that's the way we took exams. So um, there are limits to ad health, like I could have been in ad health. Um, so the, the, the data are a little old and we're talking about the complete networks at this point in time, um, but for whatever that's worth. Um, so foci and common uses here, we're often talking about the role of perceptions of social relationships and their implications for various processes. Um, I would also argue that the limit, primary limitations of, 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 uh, of survey research often are evaluated as being perceptions of social relationships. Um, and whether that's a strength or a benefit probably depends on your theoretical premise and your questions. Um, I, I wouldn't argue that it's universally either of them. I would argue that it's often both and, and we need to evaluate these appropriately as a result. Um, and this is a prime example of this. I often just include it because it's one of the funniest paper titles. Um, the Cloning Headless Frogs paper by, uh, by Beerman and Perigi basically suggests that these kind of GSS type important matter questions, what we're capturing, we might not know what they're actually talking about when they identify important matters, right? So cloning headless frogs was one of the important matters that one of the respondents in their survey said that they were talking to one another about. And their claim is, so are these inherently important topics? I mean, we could debate that all day, um, but Matt Brashears um, and some others have done some kind of follow-up work on this that suggests Sometimes it really doesn't matter what they're talking about. It's the perception of what's important that matters for kind of the availability of social support, the availability of kind of access to resources that we might think of as, as mattering in social networks. So I think this is a useful debate. I'll loop back to it later um, when I talk about kind of what we focused on in network measurement in particular um, in ways that I, I, I think that there's, there's a lot of value even if we don't know what exactly they're reporting on for a variety of reasons. Um, Probably the biggest kind of limitation of survey research in networks is participant cost. 
it's just time intensive, right? If you've ever collected network data, you know this, right? As soon as we ask people who their partners are, we usually follow up with the name interpreter questions of their various attributes, particularly if we're an egocentric design. And even then, I've done this, where we then ask them to report on the relationships between their partners, right? And so every time you add a single relationship, you're adding often some multiple number of additional questions and the, the temporal cost that that adds often just is not available in some surveys. It, it often kind of it degrades the quality of data. There's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of problems that it, this introduces. Um, so I would suggest one of the kind of key adaptations here that's been particularly intriguing um, is what have been labeled in an older paper, participant-aided sociograms, that is basically kind of drawing as you collect, um, is the way you can think about this. And this isn't a particularly new idea either. This is from Lynn Freeman's old book, um, where he talks about the way people did this like pegboards, and then people have done it with papers and like stickies. But if you're familiar, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Network Canvas. Network Canvas has basically digitized this, 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 uh, this strategy in ways that I find to be a really compelling um, opportunity where they um, both then elicit, networks, uh, uh, elicit network nominations, then they can do name interpreter questions like attributes, who are these people, how do you know them, um, that are both on the kind of node level and on the relational level, and they can do then kind of relation, what are some refer to as relational interpreter questions about the associations between your or partners um, in ways, and one of the main reasons I mentioned this, it accomplishes a lot of things. People are inherently self-interested, right? So being able to see their own networks makes the process more enjoyable, and in being more enjoyable, often we get kind of better response rates and we get improved um, kind of quality of data from just engaging with people in this way, which is what that kind of paper, the this paper by uh, Bernie Hogan and, and Juan Antonio Carrasco et al. Um, talked about, um, and so we get kind of uh, improved data out of this. Um, the second problem it solves for us in the network context is the encoding of data, right? It, it kind of automatically turns your data into something that is a structure that you, you can often kind of very quickly turn into analytic capacity. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a really nice opportunity. I mentioned I was on the board for helping kind of advise some of this, but I've done very little actual work. So um, I've been looking for something like this for literally like 15 years. So when they did, I was like, please, um, I'll, I'll, help, I'll help as much as I can. Um, the other suggestion I would say that is particularly in the kind of opportunities area for us in the social sciences is thinking about what the network science side of the world has come to label higher order networks. And all we mean by higher order networks um, I thought I had a slide here, but apparently that's later, um, are things like multiplex networks, hypergraphs, et cetera, which I think we're losing some ground on in the social sciences, to be honest. I think we've focused on single relationships at a time for a reason, but I think we need to think broader than that as we move forward. Um, the other thing I would argue that surveys should do more of is we have often imposed our meaning on relationships. We've decided what the ties are that matter a priori, and sometimes that's useful for some questions. For a lot of questions, it really isn't. A lot of questions that would be more valuable for us to allow the respondents to tell you what the ties are that matter for the processes we're trying to study. And I think I'm going to make a claim later that might be a little controversial for some of us in that regard. Um, so the last kind of modality I want to highlight here is um, thinking about digital trace data. Right, so this is the classic kind of what breadcrumbs get left behind. Can we gather them and use them as data sorts of things? This isn't new either. This is exactly what Stanley Milgram's you know, small world experiment was, if you really think about it. Um, but these often are focused on high frequency, large scale processes. Increasingly, that's true as it becomes kind of digital trace data from other things. Um, to focus on large scale and dynamic processes, I think is, is one of the things these data are particularly attuned for. Um, so you may have heard or read various studies that use kind of these remote, these remote sensors, right? So people can wear things, at one point in time, we were wearing things around our neck and you, it would record the interactions as you kind of were talking to people face to face or encountered them throughout the day. This is a paper by um, Alessandro Vespignani and some of his colleagues um, where, they, where they demonstrated one method for doing this. This has then subsequently been kind of evaluated and compared to other data sources. So this is a, a comparison of kind of these digital moats to like di paper diaries of interactions throughout the day and how these overlap with one another. My argument is they capture different things that are overlapping. They aren't meant to capture the exact same thing. Um, and we should, we should recognize that. Um, 
And often these types of data get used for things like model calibration and predictive sorts of aims. Um, so this is a paper by Marcel Soleil and Jamie Jones where they show using exactly this type of data in a school um, and the interactions in that school can, can be useful to account for how community structure in that school leads to different epidemic outcomes on a flu-like outbreak, um, where they talk about how, it how the kind of community structure leads to different both time and kind of length of the epidemic and um, the kind of uh, uh, final extent or amplitude of, of, those, of those outbreaks as well in ways that ironically I was teaching this paper right before COVID hit in ways that like we, my students were like learning um, a lot of the things that they, the, the general public was learning, you know, three weeks later, because this kind of demonstrated a lot of those, you know, the, the, the intervention names that we had later. Anyway, the idea here is that, that we can use these types of breadcrumb data to, to seed models um, in very informative ways. I'm going to make a really brief aside that has nothing to do with data collection. Um, and, and that is that I think that, as Jim talked about yesterday, the way we use the word model often means so many different things that it's very confusing to people. Um, and in the COVID, kind of height of COVID era, um, the models became kind of a public thing. And so I wrote this little piece um, that, that became actually useful in a number of ways. But my, main, my main thing that I want to kind of point out here is that there are different models that have different purposes. Causal explanatory models is what we in the kind of sociology world often are interested in most things outside of that really don't care about. There are other types of models that, uh, the labels here don't matter, but the notions do. Um, what, what have come to be labeled by some as kind of scenario projections. This is kind of the what if scenario. If, if, we, if we turn on some lever, what would we expect to happen? And for a lot of COVID models, that's what we were doing. We we're trying to inform policy. If you take on this policy, what would we expect to happen? And often we don't ever expect that to actually happen because behaviors change, policies change, other policies kind of go in. But the idea is thinking about how those levers getting turned on and off would have particular implications which is also different from predictive or forecasting models that are trying to account for what the future is going to look like. And the reason I make this as a side is when we do things like this, we want to know what the model is trying to accomplish. And evaluating a model based on kind of the wrong aim is going to lead us to make bad inferences about the utility of any model. Um, so sorry, I have to make that aside every once in a while. Um, in the kind of digital trace data, I think it's, very, it's become very clear we often don't know where the data come from. What led, to the, what, what led to the processes as we use things. I mean, Twitter is like a great example of this now, right? We used to use it for a lot of things and now people are terrified of it, but we all pro often pro probably should have been for a long time because kind of what got coded and what got represented and what we were able to get access to were all very selective processes and often hidden from our view. And I'm picking on Twitter, not because Twitter is particularly bad, but because a lot of our digital trace data have these signatures where kind of the production of the data process is often hidden from our view. And we we need to think more critically about that. Um, and there's often kind of limits in how it's, it's linked to other attributes. And again, all of these have strengths and weaknesses. I'm not arguing for or against any of these, these modalities. I'm just saying we should go in kind of eyes open to what we're using. Um, and one of the responses in particular to kind of these thin data linkages to other sources and kind of uh, unknown um, kind of data encoding procedures has been kind of linkages to other data sources. So David Laser's team uh, at Northeastern in particular has done a really great job of thinking about how they can use Twitter data and voter records and behavioral data and survey data and putting all these pieces together via various forms of crosswalks um, that kind of help both inform one another and pr predict a cross-platform type in ways that we, particularly in kind of my training kind of background, we tend to think of data as a singular entity, right? That we collect something, we analyze it within rather than kind of putting it together with these types of kind of multiple resources. And also, as Jim was mentioning yesterday, if we're talking about multimodal networks, you know, they, those types of data are everywhere. Um, and in, particularly in administrative records in the kind of health world, we can get, get a lot of relational data from a lot of existing resources. He just stepped out, so this is not gonna work because I wanted to, you know, poke fun at Jim a little bit, but he's, he's gone. Um, and this is, this is one place where we would actually, oh, he's coming back. Good. Um, this is one place where I would disagree. I don't think everything in the world is a network, um, uh, like Jim might. Uh, <laughs> I do think that there are a lot of very valuable administrative data out there that can answer network questions. I also think that sometimes we force data that aren't relational into network analytic formats. And I've increasingly been telling students who come to me with, how do I analyze this as a network? And I say, you don't, it's a different type of question, um, uh, which is something that 
we might disagree on. Um, <laughs> The main thing I would say is a particular opportunity for um, digital trace data is really thinking about validation, right? Increasingly being scrutin scru increasingly scrutinizing what's there and what's not and what it's useful for. I think it's useful for a lot of things. I think we often use it for things it's also not useful for. So I said that was going to wh where we'd spend most of the time. I'm just going to basically make one point on each one of these uh, second bullet points that I've got. So um, thinking about some practical things in network data collection, Networks are relational, so fundamentally they have the opportunity to be reported by multiple people. Right? So they can be multi reported by multiple people within the relationship, and sometimes we actually even ask people to report on the relationships they're not involved in. And so we can use that as a lever to assess the quality. I've done some of this work. This is a paper with one of my uh, former students where we're trying to predict the likelihood of romantic ties being reciprocated and what types of things are kind of predictive of that. Different kind of hidden statuses tend to reduce the reporting agreement. This is a weird paper. This is from Prosper data, if you know Prosper. Um, there are some kind of limits to that. Um, that I'd be happy to talk about. Um, but we can, we can kind of think about the assessment of data quality as something that's inherent in the data we have available to us in ways that I find a useful lever. And Weipa An has done a fair amount of work on thinking about this. So if we have various networks of, of some forms, we can kind of just represent them as we get the data, or we can take traditional approaches like intersection or union methods that says we're only going to count it if one person says it in the kind of union approach, or if both people say it in the intersection approach. Those have been kind of historically what we've done. His suggestion is we could use these assessments that I was just talking about as means to calculate what he refers to as like credibility scores of how likely people are to be kind of accurately capturing relationships that we think might matter. And then we can use those credibility scores to weight our representations of networks. We could just take the person who is the most credible and recode those as what they refer to as the deterministic approach. Or they can take like a, st a statistical approach. And this is something we in the network community really don't do a lot of. Think about our network representations as probabilities of a tie existing rather than as a tie being there or not. Um, and I think our methods often assume this in the way we model things, but we often don't translate that in the way we treat our data. We often treat our data as real and then our models are estimations. In reality, our data are estimations too, and this is something that allows us to take that explicitly into, in, into account. Um, Boundary specification, one comment on this. Um, this is uh, an extended quote from the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the Lauman et al. paper that basically suggests that boundary specification is a socially con kind of constructed process that we as researchers are often doing. We can think about it as sometimes a methodological imp imposition, sometimes a, an assumption of what's going on at the system level, sometimes we allow the people inside to define these things. My suggestion is, Instead of thinking about this as a methodological kind of constraint, this is actually an opportunity for theoretical exploration. The boundaries of networks are often as interesting as the, what's going on within the network that is bounded. And I think that's something that we in the networks have often taken boundaries as given or defined, rather than exploring the space of what's going on at the boundaries of networks as, uh, as something of, of our theoretical interest. Observational, particularly ethnographic research, is much better at this than survey researchers, and I think we should adopt that, is one of my suggestions. This is one of my big um, kind of hobby horses lately, is thinking about meaning. Um, uh, and this is a really lovely paper by Stacey Torres that talks about what she refers to as elastic ties, which is thinking about ties as neither strong nor weak, but ties that at some times are strong, at some times are weak, and we deploy them in different ways for different purposes in different contexts, even in the tie the same relationship, in ways that I think suggest, and this is probably the, more contra the, the one kind of most controversial thing I might say today, is that I think in data, network data collection, we've probably traded off a focus on precision of measurement for a loss in some ways of kind of fidelity to the processes we're actually interested in. I think we've kind of verged on scientific kind of practices of overly emphasizing kind of measurement quality. And I've published on this, so I'm critiquing myself as much as anyone here um, as, as our goal rather than kind of faithfully representing the processes, whether or not that's kind of measurement driven is, is, is up for debate. So all this to say, I think we should go back to thinking about what, mean, what ties mean as something we're actually collecting information on rather than something we assume as we go into data collection. Higher order networks I mentioned earlier is something I think we really have an opportunity. If you're not familiar with it, I mean, you're probably familiar with at least one of these, like you know, bipartite networks and, or multi-mode networks, multiplex networks or multi-layer depending on your field. Longitudinal, I think you can kind of layer into this as well. Um, or hypergraphs. A lot of our processes aren't 
the types of networks we represent them as, and therefore we're modeling them in constrained ways, and I think we should be a little bit more flexible as we go forward and thinking about what our data should look like. I would also argue that the longitudinal approach we often take of like panels is an over constraint as well because most are kind of emerging processes through time. Um, all right, cool. So the last thing I want to mention are a couple things about ethical considerations in network data. And this is um, an ironic kind of moment. I've made a like passing statement in the conclusion of my chapter where I said, well, maybe someday we'll have standardized ethical kind of practices in network research. But it's hard because we're a very interdisciplinary group and we often kind of adhere to our norms within. So the idea um, that I was floating at the time was, was kind of broad, but now it turns out I, I'm, I've helped launch, uh, we're, we're kind of working on an initiative where we're trying to produce a very simple part of this, not anything very complex, but a very simple part of this. Any of you who have collected network data and had to deal with your own IRBs, uh, many people, many of us have had to negotiate with our, our IRBs what's proper and what's not in network data collection. So we're trying to produce like a two page document that basically is kind of what standards are for things like consent, for things like uh, uh, voluntary participation for things like deductive disclosure, et cetera, um, and that you could take and say, hey, look, what I'm doing fits with kind of what's expected. We're not trying to impose new standards. We're trying to establish that they actually exist and we have them in common and we can kind of demonstrate that what people are doing um, are, are, are follow this. So if you're interested in that, please follow up with me. Um, we, have a, we have a good group working on it, but I think that's a, a task that could, could use a lot of hands. Our goal is to have this be a document that is sponsored by both Sunbelt and NetSci. Um, um, and uh, that we'll see how well that goes. Right now we have a lot of INSNA, we have some NETS I buy in. Um, but the reason this matters is things like voluntary consent are fundamentally different in the network context, right? A relationship doesn't belong to any one person. So we have to think about um, how we kind of do this appropriately. There's problems in kind of the opt-in um, opportunities, the kind of if we're doing link tracing designs, you can't ask people about a relationship they're in, in without having that person's permission, but you can't know that you need that person's permission without having the relationship. So like, what do you do? Um, and there, there are ways around this. I'm not suggesting this is like a problem we're stuck in, but these are the things that are unique to networks that are different from kind of other types of approaches that we're often having to negotiate with IRBs. Um, the good news is there's things we can lean on, right? So I've argued that we can think of um, a lot of these kind of relational patterns um, in IRB considerations is very similar to what demographers have long called secondary subjects research, where we're reporting on other people. Sometimes we can think about it as kind of perceptions of relationships to our benefit, not just to our detriment. Um, there's lots of ways to kind of leverage this. For what it's worth, the QR code and the link is to, I, my talk at this last year was on ethical considerations in networks broadly. So this is just like one slide from, um, and these slides should be posted at some point. So, and it's on the next, it's on another slide. It's on another slide in a second. I saw you with your camera. It will be up in just a second. Um, um, there it is. Um, <laughs> um, and, and this is, um, what I, was, what I was starting to say is um, that another place where this is particularly germane in the networks research, networks world is we, liked, we like our visuals. Our visuals are useful. I think they're highly useful. Um, but as soon as you present a network and label one node, you often can infer or learn the kind of identities of a lot of other people. So one proposition, and this has kind of been demonstrated in a lot of sources, one thing I've been floating with recently uh, suggesting is maybe what we do is instead of presenting our data as we have it, we now have a lot of these tools to generate models. We can then, inside those models, we often simulate networks that are conforming to those models. Instead of presenting the kind of real networks as we observe them, we can use these models to then simulate and generate a plot of a network that represents the social processes that we think matter. And so I'm picking a particularly weird example, like there's nobody who's concerned about the ethics of the presentation of the Florentine families in the 1400s um, at this point in time, but that's exactly what's going on here. This isn't the actual marriage or um, resource exchange um, network. This is a model of, in this case, the kind of flow patterns in that population that was generated with an ergom that then they represented a representation of that still shows the Medici in a particularly unique position if you're familiar with the story, but not exactly their relationships. And I think this would be a way we could preserve some of those concerns that IRBs have in realistic ways, still get our visuals in there, but not cause problems in the ways that we often have with some of the data visualizations we've presented in the past. Like for example, no, I won't go there. Um, so I'll just say that at one point in time, there was a data set I wanted access to you couldn't get access to it. I found a visualization of it online. You literally could hand code the network, right? And so I then produced a model of that network from the hand coding of that visualization because you can. 
Ask me, ask me later which data. Um, <laughs> And the last thing we're talking about in that initiative is thinking about storage and sharing of network data as an ethical consideration. And I'm going to punt on that to the ideas pro idea in that project that you heard about yesterday. So I'm going to stop there. Awesome. Questions, comments? Jimmy, I think you can your own questions. Sure. Yes, please. Yeah, I think, I think this is actually exactly one of the examples that kind of the types of examples that drive me to make that, that point is that I think we have had a tendency to assume we as researchers know what the questions are we care about and therefore we draw these boundaries in ways that are um, informed by our theoretical assumptions, our theoretical goals, and maybe not so much by what's going on on the ground. And so I would argue that it's the, the way that um, it, this has often been presented in the boundary specification is this kind of like externally defined or internally defined. And I would argue that the better research is gonna do both of those at the same time um, and take the kind of endogenous kind of identification as a serious problem. That then kind of iteratively informs the way we kind of go in and, and, and make our assumptions from the front. Um, and I, I don't think that it, it, the either or framing as we've traditionally talked about it is really the way to go about boundary specification. It's not, it's not and community-based kind of stuff is a particular example of this. If we think about like a neighborhood, I, I, love, I love research on just kind of defining neighborhoods. What the heck a neighborhood is gets defined a lot of different ways kind of operationally, but it also gets defined a lot of different ways by people in the neighborhood. And so if we can recognize that and think about allowing for those multiple definitions, which is why I talk about meaning, is something that we, um, and the social sciences have a tendency not to do. We like to know what our, what our meaning is, operationalize it, and go measure it. And the idea here is that maybe we need to allow for these multiplicities of meanings to be something that we focus on rather than kind of explain away or treat as nuisance. Um, is that what you were after, or is there something more? Yeah, so I don't know how much you heard of what that was, but I mean, essentially the, 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 the point was that kind of different definitions of kind of communities can lead to really different kind of Im, Im, implications for how we go about studying those things. And I, I agree 100%. This is, I mean, a conversation I'm having with one of my students right now who's doing kind of community-based story work where she's thinking about interventions for kind of immigrant-based communities and, and, and kind of thinking, and that, the thing I would add is not only do different people have different definitions of what those communities are, the same person has different definitions of what those communities are at different times and to different audiences. And, and I think we have often treated that as a problem for our measurement rather than the reality that we're trying to represent. And that is exactly what I am trying to suggest that kind of a return to a focus on meaning as our goal um, is something in networks that we would do well to pay attention to in this form or lots of others for what it's worth. I saw a hand over here somewhere. Yeah, so during this, Yeah, so elast the Elastic Tide paper is like a, 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 it's a very rich multi-method, multi kind of she does ethnographic interview and survey data um, kind of all at once. And I think that's one of the answers to multiplex kind of questions is we can kind of open our, open our toolkit a little more than we have a tendency to do. 
Um, as far as kind of just more traditional kind of multiplex sorts of things, um, something that Ego Network Research has done for a long time is, is thought about kind of edges as, relation, as kind of dyads, and then think about the, re the, the representation of relationships inside those as kind of an interpreter type question. So that's one of the ways we can do this is kind of layering these things within, in, within each other instead of thinking about them as separate questions. It leads to a different problem though then that I've often, I've often labeled as like a de denominator problem um, of like if you start with one and then you kind of elicit underneath that, then you don't know all those other ones, whether or not they're kind of unique or just the subset. And so I think you have to play that trade off appropriately. Sometimes you are going to need kind of multiple strategies. This is why I think some kind of these visual strategies are particularly useful. You can think about identifying these things, start to draw them in, and then you can layer different colors on top or different kind of relational types on top in ways that are much more um, adaptable in the process rather than, I think a lot of our even visualized data collection approaches have basically been taking what we used to do in paper and pencil and like just translating it directly into digital formats instead of thinking about digital format as really giving us a different type of opportunity. So if we think about data collection as a negotiated process, instead of as me eliciting data from a subject, um, then I think it also allows for these kind of multiplex things to be uh, enumerated a little bit better. I think, did you have? I thought I saw your hand. Um, yeah, more so. Cut, cut us off whenever we need you. But. Yeah, just a, a musing. I work in higher education and I look at social networks in higher education. And often um, the data that I have is not primary data. So you talk right. a lot about primary yeah, yeah, data yeah. collection, um, whereas there are tons of surveys in higher mm -hmm. education that focus, that do have relational data, but Absolutely. it's secondary Absolutely. data. And I'm sort of working through. The challenges and the tensions of that, you do mention about Twitter a little bit, but um, yeah, so more so it's like a comment of a question, of, I mean, ethics around doing that, around um, just secondary data analysis yeah. and how to use it, or if you have um, resources to help me further yeah. sort of grapple with this, that would help. Yeah, particularly in the education kind of world, this is a lot of repurposing of data, right? Yes. We're having to kind of rethink about what the data represent and use them in ways that often it wasn't what they were designed yes. for. And sometimes that's great because they do have kind of explicitly relational stuff in it and we can just code it up. Sometimes it's problematic though because we're having to kind of use proxies to generate kind of representations of networks in these ways. So this is one of the things, um, I, I managed to do a PhD with Jim, a postdoc with Peter Bierman, and never open ad health data until, <laughs> uh, uh, until about five Five years later. Um, and um, the reason I mentioned that is to say that anytime I start in with a new data set, first thing I do are a lot of these kind of data evaluation questions. And, and that is learn kind of the, the warts and the benefits of the data that you have in ways that I think these kind of exploratory papers often get dismissed. I've published, anytime I've used a new data set, we often publish that first. But it also then helps inform the questions that I actually want to use the data for in ways that kind of show where it's going to be useful and where it's not because we are always proxying what we really care about when we're using other people's data and sometimes they're great for it and sometimes they're not. So like Prosper, for example, that I'm using in a number of papers right now. I don't know if you know Prosper. It's a sample of like 40 some schools in Iowa and Pennsylvania. We can talk about that. Um, but one of the constraints that Prosper imposed was they only elicited romantic and um, friendship nominations within grade level. Um, and, and they didn't allow for nominations across grade level. And I don't know how much you study schools, but this is actually coming, becoming very common. Lots of network studies are doing this right now, and I think there's reasons that's useful. It makes it easier to, kind of, to, to match and those sorts of things. Um, but for some questions, it's just problematic. And so knowing those things and what the implications of those are um, is important. So this is where, you know, good, kind of informed either kind of simulated or theoretical work of like what a process could look like versus what it does look like is something that I think we in the network world who are very empirically driven sometimes skip past is like we can represent very well what you know, centrality statistics, what social closure processes, et cetera, look like on our data. But what could they have looked like if the data were different or if the data actually represented what we think about is something that um, I think all too often we as researchers skip right past and we fail to recognize the difference between that difference of what's possible versus what's observed versus what's observed and what's expected. And I think we conflate those in problematic ways in our analyses all too frequently. So good old fashioned data exploration is a really important first step when you're using other people's data. Yeah. All right, Jimmy, folks, we have one question. Jimmy, just uh, catch up on the break.